as the presenter this morning. Uh, you know us, he's still in London, England, not London, Ohio. Um, and so that was gonna make presenting here difficult. Uh, so Tom has a presentation he threw together um, that he's gonna give us on modern times, specifically around passwords. Uh, so give it up for Tom. Yay. Now this one usually runs a little short, and I, I know you're all just absolutely hating me because you know, need to stay away from that cake. So passwords. Uh, first, I'm Tom. I look fancy. Uh, I've got websites, Twitter, Google Plus, whatever. I also walk around a lot, so that camera's probably not going to follow me. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, I'm everywhere across the internet. So, in essence, the password is old. How long have we been using passwords? Thousands. Yeah. I mean, you can go back to the speakeasies, you can go back even before that. You know, a guy knocks in there, whoa, what's the password? Bubbles. All right, you're in. Unless I'm into the bar and you'll have a good time. But we've learned a lot, right? We can't just use bubbles as the password. That's simply not good enough, especially not when we can guess a thousand passwords a second on the slow end. So here are the bad guys. Here are the things that we have to watch out for. Here's the things that are trying to make our world more insecure or more inconvenient. Uh, probably the biggest, the most common is a wordless attack. Um, you saw Dave Kennedy take a look at uh, you know, uh, certain passwords, certain user behaviors, and how he's trying to use education to fix those. We'll go into that a little bit later. But if you teach people to use really bad passwords, like the name of their dog plus the year, or the season plus the year, it's a really bad password. Um, what a wordless attack does, for those who don't know, is it takes the most commonly used passwords puts them at the front of the list and says, okay, we're going to try those first. We're just going to run through the list and you'll get about half of them in most organizations. Uh, the next thing is, and it's not really commonly used unless you're trying to crack something that you've stolen locally as a brute force attack. You literally just run through every combination of characters that could possibly exist for a given language and hope you crack something. Very slow. You never use it in an actual attack, per se, uh, if you're doing something remote. It's just too slow, too noisy. Um, common account attacks. This is getting more common in the internet. Uh, if you use the same password for Twitter that you use for your exchange admin, you're going to have a bad day. When LinkedIn leaks your password and it happens to be your domain admin account, uh, it's, it's game over at that point. Uh, you shouldn't really reuse passwords, but we keep telling people this, but they keep doing it. And that's kind of our fault. I'm going to some of the things that you know people in IT do, uh, people like me, people like my organization, say, oh, you're going to have all these characters, and it's going to be this long, and people will make one really good password that hits the majority of their sites, and they'll use it for everything. It's bad, but it's our fault that they're doing it. Forgetting passwords. Here's something that people don't really think of as, you know, part of your standard set of bad guys. If people are forgetting their passwords, they're going to make simpler ones. Plain and simple. They're going to make ones easier to remember. They're going to have passwords.doc on their desktop. Or they're going to be scribbling sticky notes all over the place. Check under the keyboard. It's always under the keyboard. Always. The things that make a good password, we've got entropy, which is jumbling up characters. It's the randomness inherent in a password. Um, if your password is ABCD, it's pretty easy to make a program to enumerate that to get the password easily. Uh, if it's got more entropy, it's going to be harder to crack. And it's all pretty easy stuff, but we'll get into the better stuff in a bit. Um, and one other thing, I don't really like to just sit up here and be a talking head. Please interrupt me. I, I like having a conversation more than I do just talking. Um, length is definitely the most important thing when it comes to passwords. And we're starting to see organizations 
value length over complexity over certain rule sets and even take away password rules as the password gets longer. It's a really novel concept and actually leads to much, much happier users and much better passwords, way better security. And again, uniqueness. Don't reuse passwords. It's just a bad idea. So here are some brute force times at a relatively modest 1,000 guesses per second. Uh, this is assuming, you know, no lockouts, no compensating control. If you just have a slow network connection and you're attacking a system, this is what it would take to guess these passwords. Now, here's some cool stuff. Because you use different characters, you've got ten poss or nine possible characters, or ten possible characters if you're using just numbers, right? So the list of possible passwords is a lot shorter than if you include letters and then uppercase and symbols. And it just keeps getting bigger the bigger your rule set is. Uh, so, yes? You, you, for the listing of all, all those times, does that, does that factor in any, uh, well, I don't know, any, co any common passwords? Or does it just assume no password is common? No, this is just straight up really dumb brute forcing. There's no intelligence at all in this list. Um, as you can see, in, in the bottom two examples, just by adding one more character, you can make a password way, way harder to brute force. But it's, it's not about brute forcing, right? So someone tell me, and raise your hands, which of these is more secure? Which of these passwords? Well, consider see, the, these reference you're using. The bottom is obviously more complex, but like I told you uh, in past presentations, the only company I wasn't able to break into was a company where all their employees had three character passwords because I didn't think anyone would get two. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So again, one more character makes your attacks way more difficult. You don't need complexity for security. You just don't. Uh, this, the general gist of this presentation is more of a look of, uh, at the social component, the human component, the squishy component of security, how we can make the humans better at what humans do well, not a lot, but make them a little better at what they do poorly. Um, people won't remember this. If you say, well, my password is the name of my dog and I just hit zero nine times. Okay, all right, that's, that's okay. That's way better because you're not writing down a password. You're not gonna use it for Twitter and Facebook and your email account and your work email account and all this other stuff. So here's a couple things. This is what we tell people to do. We tell them to use a password manager. We tell them to you know, log into LastPass or 1Password or KeyPass or whatever. Anything on Earth just to make something long, complex. Just don't use your mother's maiden name as your password, anything. And then this is what they do. Everyone does this, right? So, so how many people work IT or InfoSec? Probably, yeah, the majority of the room. Right? How many times do you see that password? Probably a fair amount. You know, some combination of something and then some numbers. I mean, it's a basic, it, it's the default word list in everything. If somebody says, hey, let's make a word list and crack some passwords, you start with word, then some numbers. That's how you build a word list. That's rule number one. That password doesn't hold up over time. Here's, here's what users do. And this is all of our faults. So, of course, the first one, common word, some numbers. The second one is really, really common. As Daryl likes to point out, uh, you all can change your passwords to summer 2014, uh, because we're now officially in summer. So prepare yourselves for fall 2014. 
I probably shouldn't say this off camera. Uh, my company, half of the people use this password because I haven't been able to break them yet. Um, it's bad. It's it's really bad, and it's all our fault because we say, hey. Uh, you've got to have something that's at least 10 characters long. You've got to have capitals. You've got to have numbers. And you have to change it every 90 days. Oh, well, that's convenient. Or you have to change it every month. Well, just use the month. I know people that every month it's, you know, August 2013 and then their first name. That's the password. And this happens a lot. Do you guys see this? Am I the only one who sees this? Everyone's seen it, right? So a, a couple other common ones, and the third example isn't horrible, it's bad, uh, but it's not the worst thing I've seen. At least they've got some punctuation in there. Uh, and of course, the bottom, it's abysmal. Um, I see that a lot. I see user initials plus some numerical version of year plus month. That happens a ton. We did this. Uh, and a lot of government organizations mandate password changes to comply with various regulations. And that's a real damn shame. Um, we are causing bad security practices by forcing people to not just choose a really good password from the get go and say, yeah, you can stick with it. Have that one be done. I'm also the VPN admin at my company. We've got RSA tokens. They all need a pin. They say, do I have to change this every month? I say, no. Choose one that's six characters long, and I won't even look twice at it. You will never have to change it as long as I'm in charge of this. They pick something crazy complex. They don't pick their birthday. I mean, I run the system. I know what they pick. Because um, RSA isn't very good at obfuscating user data. Um, but they pick something that's, to me, seemingly random to them, memorable, complex, they'll use it. And it's two factors of the risk is pretty far mitigated that way. And this is pretty controversial. Forced password changes decrease security. They don't do anything. They don't help anyone, ever. Except in one very tiny, tiny case, if a piece of malware gets on your system and it's using a password, and it needs to use your password for a very long extended period of time, that's when a forced password change would really affect anything. But you basically got, if you get a piece of malware, if you get an attacker who's trying to compromise your system and he gets your password, so you're gonna be like, yep, got that password. Now I've got 90 days to kick back. No. No, he's going to take your password, he's going to root your company, he's going to get on your domain server, he's going to wreak havoc, he's going to take all your data instantly. He's not going to sit around and wait because he knows, well, I've got, you know, maybe 60 days, maybe 60 whole days to use this password. This is great. Now he's going to get his work done real quick. Malware is going to get his work done real quick. The only thing forcing people to change their password does is it forces them to make really really bad passwords, you know, like these. Horrible, awful passwords, because it fits in so nicely. It hits all the complexity rules, it gets IT off your back, it lets you get some damn work done, and you can apply it to every single password change, because it always works. That's, that's terrible. We shouldn't do that. So what can we do, right? We do the only thing that makes sense. And it's really hard to do, right? You can't do this in straight up Active Directory. You've got to have some add-on somewhere. In Linux, you can do anything. But in Active Directory, being a little bit harder to extend, you've got to have a custom module. Great passwords shouldn't expire. Well, what makes a great password? And yeah, some people are throwing things at me at this talk, so thank you for not. But what do you guys think? Passwords suck. Well, yeah. You should use passphrase. Yes. Up a Unicode characters. <laughs> you can't actually type. Yes. Windows, you need to probably want to 
I believe this one the Barracruz, the wood land man. Mm -hmm. Ash cracking. Anyone else? I no? Yes. Yeah, I'm just sure of binary octave bit with any thing in the lap of it. I don't believe in using cocaine bits. THP doesn't parse any code uh, the same way it does at C. I think we can get, we can discount that advice because PHP. I'm just kidding. I, I also write PHP. I understand your pain. It's it's awful. Unfortunately, for compliance, there's some where it doesn't matter. It's always the government or whoever regulates those compliance changes the mind. Right, which means it'll never happen. True. Right. The government compliance is never going to change. Well, the Earth can get hit by a meteor. Yeah. As best practices, all we right. have PCI, but we're going to do PCI as best practices. Those kind of people would never deal with any of this stuff. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing that Target implemented PCI. Right. Yeah. yeah. They did a great job. They did a great job. Yeah. Totally <laughs> saved everyone a lot of hell. All of you have seen this. This is very common. It's going around the internet. It's the famous XKCD, the correct horse battery staple, and where. Randall Monroe points out very lovingly that the only thing we've done in, in InfoSec uh, and in IT security policy is we've made people choose passwords that are easy for computers to guess and hard for humans to remember. That's what we've accomplished. The good news is we can fix that. It's not impossible. We just have to change our thinking a little bit. Correct for its battery stable isn't a bad password. I wouldn't use that exact one. I'm sure it's on plenty of work. That's, that's inside my dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not bad. I mean, from a password standpoint, that's actually pretty good. The, the moral of the story is, is longer is better, always. That's what she said. It is. <laughs> we should be listening, right? Longer is always better. And in the case of our masters, they conclude uh, discussion of Unicode, what about uh, white characters? We could do this. Sure. That was great. I don't know any word list that has Unicode characters on that aside from other languages. But passphrases. Passphrases, and I'm defining passphrases as a password that's greater than 16 characters in length. Now, just to see what type of reaction you would get, go up to you know, your, your CTO, go up to upper management, go to someone in sales and say, yeah, I'm thinking about making passwords 16 characters long. You will either be laughed out of the building or thrown out of the building. One of the two will happen. I recently tried to uh, try to implement this new policy in my company, and uh, it was a combination of the two. They were laughing and throwing. Um, still trying, very difficult. But people assume the worst. People assume, okay, so you've got to have a Hebrew word, 37 characters, a couple Unicode characters, spaces, wide characters, and some form of book that this weird author wrote in your password. And it People always assume the worst. The, the thing people can start making when you have really long passwords is they can make correct horse battery staple in all lowercase. If they have spaces, that's even better, but they don't have to. And we need to start making rules that take this into account. Now, other places are starting to do this, most notably Stanford. And it's not only Stanford. Stanford made the news, but there was actually a university that did this before them. Uh, a couple of them. So we're starting to see this in education. This made the news because Stanford is giant. This is their password rules, all wrapped up in a nice neat infographic. It's got to be at least eight characters. You can't go below that. But if you make something that's 20 or more characters, don't even worry about capital letters. They don't care. The complexity rules, the requirements for a password, shrink as the password gets longer. Because when you're looking at word lists, when you're looking at brute force tools, when you're in the 8 to 11 character range, having a good word list, a really good word list, can still sync a password. It's difficult with all of those sets, but it's not impossible. 
for 20 plus characters, as long as you stay away from common phrases, common song lyrics, and Bible verses, uh, then you, you, can, you can do that. Um, that's one of the things, one of the pieces of analysis that's been done after this change happened is they said, hey, uh, just about everyone is using some form of Bible verse or Beatles song. Uh, those are going to start hitting word lists and we have to stop that. So as long as you have a block list in place, it makes for a good password. Again, if you use the word monkey, it's on a word list, it's going to be the first one hit. If you use, uh, it's been a hard day's night as your passphrase, it's going to be on a word list, it's going to be hit. There's, there's a thing with that too, Tom. I mean, when you have passwords that 8 to 15 characters, 8 to 11 characters, the size of the dictionary that you need to enumerate all possibilities is much larger than the size of the dictionary for something that's 20 characters. Plus. Oh, yeah. I've, I've downloaded 10 character rainbow tables. And they, it wasn't the most fun download I've ever had. Oh, no, a couple hours, but <laughs> yeah. still, I mean, it's, it's a huge difference. I think I had a dictionary that was like 13 gigs. I don't remember what all it covered, but I believe it went up to 16 characters. Again, not all possibilities, mm -hmm. but still 13 gigs. If I had a dictionary that covered 20 characters plus, it's not like Petit Yeah. And God forbid they throw in a capital letter in that. Exactly. That's a lot of storage. It, it really, and uh, we can't lie. Passwords, we can't just keep doing this. We are going in circles. Yes? I found that my, um, I have word games and spreadsheets that require That's a good point to consider. Um, well, that and on top of that, if you have a 20 plus character password, and you think, oh, you know, if it's more than 20 characters, then it's just going to be either, you know, a string of characters or a str just a string of words. Instead of guessing A, B, C, you're guessing correct, Apple, correct, baby, correct, whatever, what have you, mm -hmm. instead of conventional group words. I mean, where, where do we go from there? Right, right. And I, there's no secret to it. The password, by implementing these rules, we are just pushing the wheel further a little bit. We're going to have the exact same problems going forward. The storage gets cheaper, network gets faster, processor gets faster. We're not solving any problems. This is a way to push the problem down the road a little bit. Uh, there are people who are interested in solving the password problem. This doesn't solve any of that. Um, and it's true. People are going to write word lists. There are going to be different attacks based on having giant passwords, right? Because there's a lot of rule complexity to it. Uh, there's a decent amount of processing to it. There's uh, a lot of scale. analysis on it right now, too. Yes. A lot of people who analyze the statistics of the, the passwords that are actually getting hit, the different words inside of those. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, word lists will be built. I mean, this is not immune to a word list attack. Um, if, if they're constructed well, it hurts it, and it makes it more annoying for a word list attack to happen. But as we know in security, especially security at scale, it's, the objective is not to be invincible, because you'll never accomplish that. The objective is to make yourself the smallest target possible. And if someone says, oh man, 20 character word list? Dude, no. Um, I'm just going to hit the 16s. We're, we're done with that. Or I'm going to hit the, the eight character passwords. Uh, so far, you've talked in terms of the length, and I think the assumption is that one could repeat uh, a brute force as often as one wished. So, second characteristic then would be you have a rule about timeout after failure. 
then the third principle would be do you have access to the, to the hash? And so if you have access to the hash, then it's only a matter of uh, how long under the Ethereum high power CPU does it take to build a regular table or generate one on the fly? I forgot what the stats from the earlier speaker was. 93 Yeah, Well, does that, does that turn into a 10 character rainbow table? Is that approximately what that turns into? Well, keep in mind, rainbow tables get pretty gigantic after 12 characters with your, your full set. Now, that, that's the point I'm making is that. Your table earlier was very small. <laughs> yes. And so if, if uh, the number of characters, the number of characters per second, um, could you generate a 10 character regular table in 24 hours? It'd be worth a look at for sure. If so, then you don't even need the storage to hold it. Right. Then right. You, you just run through it. You don't even care about storing the values because you can enumerate it fast enough. So, so the, to me, the, if you're going to make your point about keeping passwords simple, you have to assume that the hash is not available. Right. And yeah, that's an entirely different topic as well. It, yeah, this is protecting those things. I, I know, but if, if the hash is readily available, then none of this makes any difference. <laughs> well, the the so. As far as an attacker obtaining a copy of your password database or getting a list of hashes, um, the only thing, this, this doesn't make any difference. You're entirely right. This doesn't help that attack at all. Uh, it doesn't mitigate anything. It might make it a little bit more annoying for a little bit longer, but not very much. Um, at least not enough. It wouldn't stop anyone, right? Um, the only thing that will prevent that attack is by using a secure hashing algorithm to store your passwords. Um, uh, Password-based key derivation function, um, bcrypt, for instance. If So I, I got a list of um, MD5 passwords. Not even solid, just straight up MD5. It's like, huh, oh, this is fun. Threw them into a, um, a rainbow table and got it back, done. I also got a list of bcrypt passwords. And I said, all right. So I tasked out a machine on Amazon EC2 to go crack those. I let it run for 24 hours and ended up with one password out of the thousand. Uh, as long as you do, in that attack, as long as the technology implements a secure hashing algorithm, there's not a lot you have to worry about. There's still some, because if they're trying to crack one password, especially if that person has reused a password and that service is using a really bad hashing algorithm, they can reuse it. So as long as all services start implementing secure hashing algorithms, it minimizes the attack vector by a huge amount. Uh, Bcrypt is one of the ones that you can't serialize. That even if you throw GPU power at it, it doesn't do a whole lot to speed things up. It does a little bit, but not on the level that you would see in SHA or MD5 or hash algorithms built for speed instead of built for security. So yeah, but you're right. So, so if you want to take the hashing piece off the table for a minute, then the next most important thing is the, the timeout after failure. Yes. And once you put that on the table, then what we ought to be calculating is if it's a 10 second or however long timeout, 10 minutes, how, how long would it take to brute force a uh, rainbow table a or excuse me, brute force a, uh, a six character password. Right. And that's why we have this slide. And then the next one, but this one first. Um, account lockouts are often used to dissuade brute force attacks. Um, and it does work. But a lot of IT organizations deploy uh, or, or set their account lockout rules incorrectly. Uh, this means if a person you know, if their password, if you have a, a proxy and it uses user credentials to log in to get people to the internet, fairly common. Uh, but a person's password expires, Windows says, hey, uh, log out, log back in. You need to change your password. 
And they're just like, oh, whatever. And they click the X and then they try to Google something and they just keep hitting refresh because the thing won't come up because the proxy's got the wrong credentials. And they just locked out their account. We can avoid that by, I mean, hopefully they wouldn't hit refresh 30 or 50 times. They might. Um, but setting a, a lockout of, say, you know, 30 to 50 incorrect attempts. <laughs> I do. I do. Well, so so in the cases in your case, if possible across the entire environment, I don't know how many employees you've got, but the more employees you've got with 30 to 40 attempts, and you probably have so many tries in a given minute, those thresholds are easy to discover. So I can easily go against a couple of accounts, figure out what the lockout is. I think I've got the answer to that in a further slide. And then I can build my entire brute force attack to fall underneath your stats and basically sit there and run forever in the day. It's, it might not be the right answer. I think I've got the answer to that in another slide. I'm going to DOS lock on the instructions. Well, I, I mean, if your servers are randomly rebooting in a production environment, you should probably know what's going on. <laughs> That's just me. That's coming from a sysadmin point of view. Um, if my server randomly reboots, I'm not, not just going to go, ah, well, if my server rebooted randomly. Good, it's about damn time. The thing was going slow anyway. It's a little weird. It's a little bit. It's some level of security, but yes, yeah, so then you have a lockout issue in your environment. Exactly. That's where your problem is. Yeah, yeah. In, in most organizations, set this way too low. I get the idea. I think this is a better solution, right? And that's the solution to your issue, but most places don't do that. And you can only implement this if you've got some sort of scan. I don't know anyone ever watches the log. I know that's the reality. Uh, what they need to do is set up auditing, uh, automated auditing. Right. So they get a little space and they have the triggers. Exactly, exactly. And that's. Yeah, you set a you set a quota, and, and yeah. not a service that goes through the, 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 the server service itself, not by building the server. Okay. You, you should still see the here's this admin. You see your your things fail like that. Right. It's still pretty noisy, and if they've got a monitoring system on the back end, it's probably setting off some alarms. Now, depending on the organization, they might not have one, and they might not care. Um, I'm interested in hearing hearing rest your solution. Yeah, so my thinking is lockouts, yeah, we can have them you know, set to 30 seconds, set to a minute um, to try to dissuade brute force attacks. Why not just slow things down progressively? Why not say, hey, look, you get five, 10 tries at a password, and then you've got to wait 10 seconds before you try another one. You get five more incorrect, Okay, we'll just add 30 seconds. And then you escalate from there up to a point, right? You don't want to lock someone out for eternity and say, well, you've got to wait the next 60 years to log, to log into your account. But I think this is better than an account lockout, especially if there's uh, a user interface element present to tell the user, hey, you can't do that. You're doing it too much. How and where do you set that? It, custom modules. It, you can't do it in straight Active Directory. It annoys me. You can use a service called Fail Yes. I use that on my Linux systems a lot. I haven't implemented it in Windows. Yeah. As far as the amount of time where you taking a, whatever you're storing that value on, reaching the maximum value of that type. And so reaching the maximum value of the lockout time? No, I mean, lockout time increasing to the point where it can't increase any further. Oh, yeah. Well, you would set that something unreasonably high, right? So if you had to wait 30 minutes to throw another password um, to your brute force engine, it would probably stop things mostly dead, depending on scale. Because what I'm saying is, I mean, having with that opens up to potentially someone just, again, just making that limit increase so high, so fast. 
You could definitely DDoS yeah, a user. Just, you could. Yeah, you, you could prevent some local logging if, if that was the goal. Yeah. Um, but your question. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. And this really only works in an enterprise environment or in an environment where you've got monitoring, you've got a sec team, you've got an ops team, you, you've got an IT team watching these things. Uh, for a home user, you know, they've got nothing. I mean, you could yank someone's internet connection for half a day and they might call Time Warner, maybe. They might wait for it to come back and they might unplug the router six times. Yeah, I should have made that clear. Yeah, this this doesn't. I still think longer passwords are good, but uh, disabling account lockout universally probably isn't the best idea. So if they had, if, if the users like if they locked out and then they had, the user themselves had a way to enable, you know, like a, a secondary login, right? Um, through their Or they have, um, I know for Rails applications, the general um, perceived best practice is through a gem called Devise. And if your account gets locked out or timed out, you can click something similar to a reset password link and it gives you a one time off code that's good for an hour. And then you click that and it says, okay, you're clear to log in now, please put in your password. So something like that would alleviate that issue. Um, but I think slowing things down is probably the better answer. I, I think it would be more effective and less disruptive than lockout. And that's really the whole point, is to make it hurt password attacks without necessarily hurting a user who's just dumb. Because we have those. They exist. And none of this means anything without some sort of monitoring tool, without a bunch of interns watching logs, without some sort of red flag like enterprise style red alert thing going off saying hey someone's doing something and a bunch of accounts are trying to get accessed rapidly you should probably look at this you should probably unplug your ethernet cables um, if you don't do that if, if there is no account lockout uh, if you're not even slowing things down it's worthless i mean you probably should be owned at that point um, <laughs> so you gotta put interns watching your logs? Hmm? Are you gonna put interns watching your logs? The way I see it, there's enough interns in the world that, that you can just take like a team of like 120 interns and say, here, watch this screen as stuff scrolls by, and they'll catch enough. <laughs> I haven't I haven't usually seen a whole lot of use of this coming from the main room. <laughs> Um, one thing this doesn't help, um, you could have a slow burn brute force attack. I don't know if anyone's going to really be that persistent, but if someone's persistent enough to hit your box every 30 minutes or every hour trying to get a password out of it, they're going to be really persistent. <laughs> There's not a lot you can do to stop that. You can lock out accounts, but they're just going to try again after you unlock them. So the default active directory of the your one setting, um, it only to actually crank up the default setting, that crank up the uh, log level to be able to do the log on too. Yes. Um, so yeah, basically, passphrases better. You know, longer is going to be better, and way more important than being complex. Longer is always better um, in just about anything. Um, monitoring tools watch your logs, get some like red alert stuff going. You need to be alerted when your network is under attack. That's, I mean, plain and simple. Um, a lot of people don't, a lot of companies don't, but if they're standing up in an enterprise environment, they should be qualified and vigilant enough to run it, or else Daryl will own them. 
Um, fail to ban, account lockout, really nasty account lockout where you say you can get your password wrong twice and then you're locked out until you call IT, who's in India, and by the way, they're asleep now, is expensive for people. It make lockout easier, either by introducing just delays, introducing short lockout periods, um, anything that'll make your users not hate you, but it'll still dissuade brute force attacks. I think delaying does that. Or you that, and or you could uh, not have uh, the staff in a country. Well, <laughs> No, I'm Let's be realistic. <laughs> Charles for president. <laughs> I'm not saying policy, but I'm just saying, I mean, if you if they're really that bad now. You'd be surprised. I've seen some things. I mean, I know, I mean, I know there is, I know the mechanics behind that particular thing is beyond the scope of this presentation, but you get what I'm so, with fail to ban, does that give you the ability to set delays? Is it? I need to look at fail to ban specifically. Okay. Okay. The really old BMS systems used to have a time delay that was actually semi-random. I mean, you would get a period from anywhere to three to five minutes added hmm. on progressively more. But what was nice about that is you could put in the absolute correct password and it would totally ignore you. You wouldn't know that it was correct if you yeah. did it during that time period. A lot of web services are, are implementing delays when you try to get an account, a single account tries to log in too much. It says, yeah, you've got to wait. And then if you keep getting it wrong, the timer gets increasingly large. Um, especially in web services, you rarely see strict lockout. Uh, you usually see with banks, healthcare, um, especially social networks or anything that's not really important data, um, you don't see account lockout, you see these delays. But monitoring tools are important. In addition to delays, you also see more and more uh, push with cloud uh, services, sort of capture challenges after somebody fails to log in attempts. Mm -hmm. uh, in lieu of like a delay, uh, just that extra challenge that would stop a brute force. It depends. Um, there's a lot of great tools that solve really great captions. Um, and anytime a new capture comes out or a new style, you'll get tools written specifically to attack those. Now, luckily, the tools leak, and then you can use them to you know, do good things with reading, like translate books or read off addresses or whatever. Uh, but it's, it's the same cat and mouse game you have with antivirus. Somebody builds a better captcha, somebody's going to build a better capture reader. In the end, everyone benefits, but we're still fighting the same thing. Any questions? Back on the case of password hashing. Um, where do we stand on that? Is it difficult to get a hashed password? It all depends on the environment and what you're trying to attack. Um, there are some, if you're attacking a Windows environment, uh, if, essentially if you're on the, the local box, you can get whatever local credentials are on the box. Uh, Windows is trivial to pull credentials from. Uh, same with Linux, OS X. Um, if you are a process on the machine, you can get the local credentials for that machine. There are ways to mitigate that, uh, but they're not by default. That was part of... Uh... Dave's talk earlier. Mm -hmm. He got a box, but he didn't have any admin credentials, so he had to help that sign in to know he did that. And when it was over to memory, it was accessible. Yeah. And as far as web services, it depends on the service, how it's implemented, what it's written in. Uh, early PHP apps, if you go back five years ago, ten years ago, um, early PHP apps that had a MySQL backend, it was really easy because no one sanitized their inputs because no one cared. Um, PHP makes it really easy to develop web applications. It's fantastic. The downside of that is you get a lot of people who shouldn't be building web applications now building web applications. 
So instead of putting in a username, they can now put in just a, a piece of a database query to pull database information out or add a user or drop all the information, what have you. Um, little Bobby table. Yes. yes, little Bobby tables. I love those. And, and back to the example of having access to the box on a workstation, that's essentially going to limit you to the transfer of the user of that workstation. Um, but the server, obviously, um, even if it's in um, using Active Directory, um, anyone who comes in through that server is vulnerable to collecting their hash? More or less. Um, Daryl would probably be more uh, qualified to answer that question than I would. Well, and for Windows, you don't even necessarily have to crack the hash. You can pass the hash data, right. or you can use tokens. So if a uh, domain admin is logged, one of the reasons Dave has been logged in, you can use the token that was logged in. So the administrator has access to the box. So I, or the server. Yeah, you can, uh, you can go ahead. If your administrator has access to the machine or the server, uh, there's a number of tools available. Uh, one, you can pull the hashes off uh, out of the box that are set on the box. You can pull the tokens, uh, the delegation tokens that can be displayed from the box. Uh, the other thing that you can do is uh, uh, go to the WCA, uh, Windows, WC, Windows credential editor. You can run that on the box and it'll actually strip anyone who's authenticated under the box's password out of uh, memory. Uh, or if you've exploited, you can also run memcaps uh, on that box, which will also pull those, uh, those same passwords out of plain text, whether they're Kerberos or, or not, uh, all out of the system in plain text if the person's authenticated. That, that all assumes they have that privilege, though, right? Yes. I, I was trying to, to come from the ground up. Uh, if I had someone's hash through uh, a less privileged method, then automatically the rainbow table gives me um, access within a matter of minutes uh, to that password. So. Uh, if they have, if you have the hash, the LM hash, the NTLM hash. Right, in a Windows environment. Yeah. In, in the Windows environment. LM hash you can draw it out pretty quick unless you have a, you know, a, a decent cracker, the person has a good complex password. You may not get the, you may not be able to easily crack the NTLM hash. But if you have the hash, there's really no need to be cracking it. You can just play those hashes. So, so it seems to me that the weakest link here is can I obtain a hash without admin Sure. Yeah. So there's lots of uh, exploits from, that do Apart from being on my, my box. Right. There's there's lots of exploits to do privilege ex escalation, um, where you take a standard user account and you can get certain additional privileges to be able to try to access things you're not supposed to. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things you would go after as an attacker. You're going to have to be system to get those hashes. We say administrator, but actually you're system on that machine. But if you compromise the process, on a machine, then you can pull all the hashes associated with that machine or gain access to the critical memory areas on that machine using the plain text password. If you just have a hash, uh, one of the typical attacks, well, I compromised the machine uh, on assessment last week, uh, and we had a guy's hash. He was not a domain admin hash. He was an active directory hash. But we want to elevate our rights within the environment. Uh, have an individual user's hash to give us access to his resources only. So we quickly replayed that hash back against the entire Windows, all the machines on the Windows environment, making a specific request through C$, dollar, uh, C dollar, um, and looking to try to retrieve a specific file, Windows System uh, 32 CMD.exe. So I planned that attack specifically looking for that, knowing that through that method we'd be able to identify what machines that person would have administrative access to, and just administrative access, because that's what we need. We played that back, this guy turned out to be a developer. We were able to gain access in an environment that had 2,000 machines. We were able to gain access to 50 machines that he had admin access to as a developer. Uh, we gained foothold to each one of those as administrators, turn around and use the tool Mimicap to pull all the passwords out of memory on all 52 machines. And by doing that, we were able to compromise uh, six domain admin accounts. Uh, so it's a matter of 
it's an influence. Spread the influence, estimate data, spread the influence. So, that's so there's two factor on your domain server stop then? Uh, what was that? Two factor authentication? <coughs> yeah, two factor authentication on your domain server to hold the hash table. Does that stop what you just went through? It will stop some stuff. I, I have yet to encounter anyone with two factor, um, but I have discussed that topic with other people. Uh, the two factor authentication will stop certain levels of access. Typically, that level of access is being stopped when you RDP. So I'm not going to be able to RDP to that bot, but I can still make SMB requests to that oh, box okay. and not be challenged. <coughs> Since I can make SMB requests to that box uh, as an admin level, bypass an RDP interface, uh, I can easily access that box right from that box. That's that's what I understand on how it functions, but I am not done. And if they did, I didn't pay attention to it because I rarely go to RDP. I just go to RDP just to screw with them so they can't get through the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Got anyone else? Cool. That's it. Thank you, Tom.